What happens at laser tag never stays at laser tag. Laser. Laser on focus tag talk. Laser on focus tag talk. I feel like you could be like in Ghostbusters or something. Like oh my god, you have got some stories. Let's talk about laser tag. Who knew you were a laser tag legend? Time to get laser unfocused. Tag talk with Tivia. Welcome to Laser Unfocused Tag Talk. Hi, I'm Tivia. Flexibility, resiliency, and thinking outside the box are all beneficial for responding to transitions and a wide variety of scenarios, whether you're operating a storefront laser tag arena or a mobile operation, as we hear about from one laser tag operator who has done both. So I'm joined now by Kip Walker, who is the owner of Laser Trooper Laser Tag, mobile operations out of Topeka, Kansas. And he's here to talk with me about kind of a comparison of operating a laser tag arena in a fixed location versus a mobile laser tag business as he does now. So Kip, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. So I thought maybe we could just start with kind of an overview of your uh, experience being a laser tag operator. Where did it start and what what is the evolution from um, from where you were with an arena to mobile and and where did it start? It started with some uh, high school kids that were bored one day. They took my new, they needed a driver. So we drove to Kansas City to play laser tag. I was the oldest guy out there sucking wind and dripping wet and having a good time. I'd never heard of laser tag before. And uh, after 40 years of DJing, I decided that maybe it was time to shift gears. So we uh, spent almost eight years researching laser tag equipment, going to different arenas, talking to owners, uh, manufacturers, and finally decided to do something totally different than anybody else that we'd ever found and been loving it ever since. So we started out as a mobile uh, laser tag facility because there really wasn't a lot going on around here, but we did have a laser tag arena in town. And their pockets were much deeper than mine. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to compete head on with them. So we went different direction and went with mobile. And I tried to spread it out to a bigger demographic that way. Later on, uh, we decided to take advantage of a, a special deal at our local mall, open an arena, did that for six years while still doing mobile, and um, realized the demographics were just so drastically different uh, that it was a lot of fun. Uh, so we got to play in both worlds for a long time. COVID hit, we shut down the arena and now we're strictly mobile again. So we've come back full circle to the beginning. Well, you've got a really unique vantage point because you have done both. So <laughs> let's talk a little about those demographics and what are the differences that you see between what you had with your, uh, with your fixed location versus the mobile. With our mobile, we've always gone towards the adult clientele. Uh, so we've been very heavy with colleges, corporate. Uh, we've actually done a couple of weddings, uh, all kinds of family reunions, you name it, birthday parties. But with my crew in particular, we just didn't get excited about the the younger, the youth parties, like the what you have to have in order to survive with a, a fixed location. Uh, if you're not doing well with birthday parties, the fixed location, you're not going to survive. And most of my client or most of my crew are former military and so on. And they just, that was not their strong point. So I had to kind of push towards where my crew could do well as well. But we also found that I went from about 250 to $500 for a, a six-year-old birthday party in town to strong four figures going out into the college and corporate world. So I was making more in one day than I was making in a whole week with the, the arena. So that also made a lot of difference too. So it, it's just been very interesting. I mean, we actually traveled the entire United States. You know, most laser tag guys seem to stay within 50 to 100 miles of their home. We go all over. I mean, we've been in Pennsylvania, Georgia, uh, Maryland, Texas. Baylor University has been a huge client. Uh, Temple, Old Dominion, University of Georgia, Athens. I mean, we're all over the place and we... We love it. We get invites back all the time. And with those clients, they've decided or they finally figured out that they didn't have to make us one of multiple vendors for their event. We could do it all for them. So it's just been a very different. And I think part of the reason we struggled more than others with the arena side is we came from the mobile side and we were trying to make the experience similar to when we were mobile. 
Uh, I mean, as you remember, when you came to play, we were constantly changing the arena even. Uh, that's not normal. Uh, so we were trying to do mobile laser tag in a fixed location. And that didn't go over real well for us, although we had a lot of fun and the regular clients that we had had a lot of fun. There are some people that just said it's not laser tag because we don't have vests. We don't have all the black light and the fog and, you know, the six-year-olds running around screaming. So to them, it wasn't laser tag. Um, but we had a lot of military and law enforcement coming in and pulling. And to me, that was a fair trade. So demographics, we've always skewed to the adults um, from about 16 on up, which is not where most of your arenas are going to go. Uh, One of the things I remember about your arena that really stuck out to me was the fact that I had never seen somebody change an arena midstream. For example, you had a tournament and um, midway between the games, your staff went in there and they moved walls around and it was a whole different uh, animal when you came back. So I found that interesting, but I think that, you know, your point is very well taken. And do you think that that is because of the, the nature of the equipment that you were using being a little bit leaning more tactical? I've always sort of perceived it as more of a hybrid, but it perhaps leans a little bit more towards one side than the other. It, it probably does. Uh, and that wasn't something we were intentionally trying to do. In fact, we were trying to find something that was uh, soft enough, so to speak, that we could take it onto school properties and not be too tactical. And, and it's worked well. Uh, fortunately, most people don't realize it's actually patterned after a real weapon, <laughs> which I just kind of threw that one out there, but that'll hurt me later, I guess. But <laughs> it is actually patterned after an actual rifle, but most people aren't aware of it. It doesn't look scary like an AR or something like that. But we still have the option of being able to do manual reloads and it has the, the rail to put the optics on and everything else. And those are things that are nice features that we don't really use, but they are there. Um, so yeah, it did skew that way. And that's why it, it brought in the clientele that we had, uh, the, the kids that came in were the strong Fortnite players, Call of Duty, Halo, you know, the first person shooter games. Uh, so it, it was the younger age of those games, uh, that would come into play and they had a, a great time because it was unlike any other laser tag they'd played when we were out mobile. We had some times where uh, playing games like Last Man Standing, where you'd have ultimately a bunch of snipers just encamped somewhere. And it got a little stale because everyone was waiting for somebody else to take the shot. So we started moving the obstacles in mid-game. And that's kind of where some of that started. You know, So we almost incorporated Fortnite into the game by moving obstacles, taking them off the field, making people move, and forcing to speed up the game. And we tried incorporating that in the, our standing arena as well with mixed reviews. Well, I think that it's a clever approach and you are nothing if not flexible, I've noticed in terms of how you <laughs> respond and become resilient to different situations. And I think just going back to your mall uh, headquarters when you had the standing arena, you went through some need for resiliency with that too, because you were at one point on the top level of a mall and then you ended up on the bottom level. So uh, before we get into a little bit more about your mobile setup and uh, what you do now, I'd like to just kind of talk about what you perceived as the advantages and the disadvantages of having a storefront and perhaps also that storefront being in a mall retail location. What, what did you think in hindsight about um, what you went through? The storefront gave us some definite positives. It, from the mobile side, it gave us a different level of legitimacy. We were not just somebody working out of a garage. We had an actual storefront where people could find us. They could come talk to us. They knew we were going to be there. Uh, they could come check out the gear without having to raid somebody else's party, so to speak. They could kind of check it out, play if they wanted to. So it gave us a lot of flexibility on the mobile side that we didn't have working from the house, for example. It also gave us a cost-effective warehouse, a place to be able to repair equipment, uh, obstacles, try new things. A lot of our game styles that we use in our mobile side now came from the arena uh, as we tried things just to keep the arena fresh. So we incorporated both of them almost equally. And uh, it, it was nice to have a place to call home. The downside is when we were out on the road, we still had to staff the arena with equipment and people. 
And that made it difficult at times. You know, if we're going to the East Coast for two weeks and I'm taking our best system and our best employees, that leaves the arena a little on the light side. So we had to make some decisions. Uh, and ultimately, the mobile side won for us. Part of that, as you mentioned, we've been multiple locations in our mall. We started out with a, a six-week experiment, just paying weekly. I thought, you know, this gives us a chance to be someplace over Christmas. Uh, we could do some laser tag, see what happens. Prior to that, we were renting a, a community center from the local Parks and Rec every Wednesday. And some weeks I made money, some weeks I lost money, you know, typical business. But this gave us a more permanent feel. So we could leave our equipment set up. We didn't have to tear it down every night. It was really nice for, for those of us that were used to having to do all that, that moving every time we went out. But it also made it easier for parents to plan for birthday parties, uh, just family get-togethers. They knew we were going to be there. They didn't have to schedule an expensive party. They could just stop by and play one or two games. So it, it gave our clientele a lot more flexibility as well as us. Uh, our first location was rented out from underneath us, so we moved down to another location where we made it even more permanent. Uh, we actually built a wall with our concert trusting. That was the first one that you uh, saw upstairs. Uh, but we still had a lot of restrictions on us by the mall. We weren't allowed to go too in-depth because we were a temporary space and could be um, kicked out with 30 days notice or less. So we weren't going to invest a lot of time and money into the typical uh, theming that most laser tag arenas had. And that's why we went heavy with the core class and the lights and so on and went more game-centric than what a lot of places will do. Then it happened again after being there for a few years. They had somebody that said they won that spot, so we moved yet again. And each time we got bigger. And it got to be a lot of fun. We loved our last location. And then the mall changed ownership, and they wanted to raise my rent by $25 a square foot, or roughly $360,000 a year higher. That was the end of that. And Topeka is a small community. It's about 120,000 people, which you talk to just about any laser tag manufacturer, they'll tell you you're not going to make money in that size community. It's a, it's a numbers game. You need to be in a big community typically to be able to make money with a fixed location. You're going to have fixed assets. You're going to have fixed cost. Those things aren't going to change for the most part. So you have to have enough people coming in to cover your cost. With mobile, if you're not busy, it's sitting there. Hopefully, you don't have a loan on it or anything. You still have your insurance payments or pay it by the year or whatever. But the fixed cost is not the same, which makes it easier to be more flexible, run a little leaner when you have to, pick up some extra people when it gets busy. So it sounds like you had a really mixed bag of experiences as far as being in the mall with them transitioning you. Are there any things that, in hindsight, you would do differently if you were going to maintain a storefront location? You know, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, there are some definite advantages to having a permanent lease. You don't have to worry about being relocated and some other things. You know, you don't have to worry about should I be booking this event six months, 12 months out because you're going to be there. The downside of that being the rent is higher. Uh, so you do have to be a lot busier just to stay at an even keel. So we learned an awful lot from that. Uh, we got into the tournament side, which you, that was your first experience with us, if I remember right, uh, which we've been able to take to the mobile side now. We offer tournaments on colleges and corporate levels for team building. Uh, we wouldn't have done that without the arena. Uh, we've gotten into offering leagues for schools that are closer. That wouldn't have happened without the arena. So I think given the opportunity to do it all over again, I would absolutely do it again. Uh, but I would probably look into a market that's bigger so it'd be more sustainable. There are reasons why these manufacturers tell you that you need to have a population of X number of people, and it depends on which manufacturer you talk to as to what number they give you. But I wouldn't do it without a population pushing at least a million, personally, uh, because it is such a numbers game. A lot of these players will come back, even the loyal players, you'll see them once or twice a year. Unless you can get the leagues going, the tournaments going, 
the players clubs, things like that, to bring them back on a continuous basis, then you have to walk that fine line that you don't burn them out financially. So it's, it, it is a sheer numbers game of being able to get enough people in there to stay fluid and profitable. Small communities, that's hard to do. And unless you're out in the middle of nowhere where the, all there is is small communities, you probably don't have a lot of competition for entertainment either. I would entertain that as well. Uh, we looked at some small towns that didn't have anything for several hours drive for entertainment. Um, but Topeka is a lot like, say, Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska is the capital. It's an hour away from Omaha. All the entertainment's in Omaha. It's hard to make Lincoln, and they have the university, a good place for entertainment. Topeka is an hour away from Kansas City. Longmont and Boulder are an hour away from Denver. So those smaller communities that are within an hour, hour and a half or so from a large metropolis are really going to struggle. And we found that out firsthand. Now, when you go to those bigger communities, you're going to also have more competition. So you have to weigh all those things out. Uh, you can't be afraid of failure. Um, I had a, a Facebook memory post pop up this morning, and I, I put a lot of this in that post. Uh, seven years ago this weekend, we tried something that hadn't been done before. We were actually auditioning to go out on the band's warp tour, providing laser tag for the warp tour. And we went to the Rocklahoma Music Festival, and we set up there to try doing laser tag at the music festival. It was a huge failure. It sounded great, but in reality, the people who were going to the music festival weren't going there for laser tag. They were going to the music festival and the parties that go with it, not laser tag. I lost a lot of money that night, but I learned a lot. And that kind of helped us refocus some of our aspects of mobile. But I was able to go back to my arena and lick my wounds a little bit. So... For us, it's been a very good combination as we were learning and growing. We've gotten to that point now that our focus is so tight on mobile that we can survive it. It's hard to survive either one when you're getting started. We stay diverse enough and fluid enough and lean enough to be able to do both. So segueing from there, let's talk a little bit about um, the the mobile business that has kind of evolved from where you started to what you're doing now. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what a typical mobile experience looks like for you, like from the setup to the teardown, what can somebody expect out of that? For us, we are completely turnkey. Uh, we do everything except provide the space that we work in. So when we roll in, most cases, it's less than an hour for setup and less than an hour for teardown. We do anywhere from two to four hours for the event. Uh, if they don't have power, I have the generator. We bring it in and we set it up as well. We do about 50-50 between indoors and outdoors. Some of our favorite events are places where we take over the entire school or the entire building. We've played on up to five stories, stairwells, hallways, even some uh, fallout shelters. Uh, and those are a lot of fun. Uh, so that's different from when we played on horseback uh, or being in Pause a for that for a moment. You okay? <laughs> played uh, on horseback. My insurance agent had too. He goes, now, wait a minute. Where are you from? Said, Kansas. Okay, that makes a little more sense. I'm not going to insure the horses, but yes, you can do laser tag on horseback. It's a great time. Uh, we had a horse barn that hired us to come out and actually play laser tag on horseback. Oh, my goodness. We, it was great. It's on our Facebook page. It's on our web page. Just a few photos. Um, ultimately, the writers realized they weren't as good of writers as they thought they were. <laughs> so, you know, riding on a horse and shooting a gun is not as easy as they make it look on TV or in the movies. They found that out. So it was kind of a cavalry versus uh, infantry. We had a lot of ground forces and a few people on, on horseback playing laser tag in the woods. And well, you were jumping time. ahead of me because I was going to ask you, what is the most out-of-the-box or non-traditional event that you've had? Are there others like this? Well, other I'd say we've done, done weddings. We've done laser tag weddings. Uh, from the, the, my DJing days, I have all the equipment. I've done over a thousand weddings in my, my history in the past. So we'd go in and run all the sound for the wedding itself. Uh, then after the dinner and the drinking and so on, we play laser tag in the woods. The first time we did that, we'd 
fight until a Grim ran into a tree. And now he has that permanent uh, Luke Skywalker uh, scar. But, uh, you know, it's <laughs> I, I don't know that we have one that's really the most unique. We have so many of them. Uh, we actually challenge people when we're booking events and so on. Find something we haven't done. The only thing I've said no to so far, we had people wanting to do scuba diving laser tag. And it's like, no, you're not taking electronics underwater. <laughs> uh, so I did say no to that. But other than that, we've had, we did a STEM program for the Girl Scouts uh, where we actually broke it all down. The difference between the infrared uh, that the guns shoot, the RF that uses they use to talk back to the computers, the visible light that comes from my light trees and light stands the ultraviolet that we're using for black light. You know, then we got into microwaves and everything else. We showed them what the black light did, different chemicals. And we brought in a science teacher to talk about frequency and all that. And uh, they had a great time. So we had a custom patch made for laser tag for Girl Scouts. That is such and a I had, cool idea. I had councils from all over the U.S. wanting us to do it, but I couldn't get that many people out on the road at the time. So, you know, it's our mantra has been from day one, if you remember right, is forget the box, burn the box, you know, let's, we're not going to just think outside the box. We're going to burn the box and come up with our own thing. Uh, just because this has worked well for somebody else doesn't mean that has to be what we are going to be contained to. So if we think we can do it, we're going to try it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, I've had a lot of failures and I'm okay with that because that's how you learn. I really admire the idea of going out and doing a STEM program, particularly to get young young girls interested in uh, something that might not typically be in their realm. To teach them about that is an awesome thing that you've done. And it also makes me think about, um, you know, how this might be a segue into what you might do with schools. Now, uh, do you have an approach to getting schools comfortable with the idea of some of the positives of laser tag, you know, the team building and um, working together or um, how have you approached that? And, and our schools, I, I know you mentioned colleges, but do you do anything with a younger set with your laser tag? We do. I mean, every spring post proms are huge. Uh, we actually travel to multiple States to do laser, uh, laser tag for post proms. Um, Grade schools, we've been on. We've been doing quite a few fundraisers, and one of them is our favorite. That is the one that has the fallout shelter in the basement and three stories of stairs and hallways. We actually make a special deal for that particular school. They auction off. Only 20 kids get to attend. Oh. So they auction those 20 spots as their fundraiser, as part of their fundraiser. And these parents now know, because we've been doing this for about seven, eight years, seven years. These parents know coming in, only 20 kids are going to get to go that year. So if you want your child to be there, you're going to have to step up. And it's a great fundraiser for the school. It looks good for us. We get some uh, devoted clientele out of it. It's, it works all the way around. We've also, and I know this isn't quite what you're asking, we've also found that there are quite a few uh, like halfway houses and so on that we've worked with. Uh, we have some that work with adults with mental or physical challenges. We are very able. ADA friendly. The equipment that we use is very flexible. We can turn off like that button up front that you have to hold down. We can turn that off. We've had amputees play with us. We've had people in wheelchairs, uh, different mental uh, issues and so on. And we found that some of our best clients actually are autistic because it's something that they can actually plug into and they get it. Uh, and to them, it just meets their world. So there are so many aspects of laser tag that I don't think as an industry we are tapping into. And we should, because it does nothing but help the entire industry. Uh, I think laser tag as a whole is going through kind of a metamorphosis. I mean, we're seeing a lot of the vessel systems, the traditional systems, you know, and rather than compete with each other, there's a place for both of us. Uh, and as somebody that's tried being both, you know, I, I I don't think there's anything wrong with any of them. They all have great products. Uh, but I think all of this can really, if you own an arena, be reaching out to the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, 4-H, all those, and start planning STEM programs, um, team building programs, things along those lines. And don't 
don't be afraid to try something. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, try something different next time. And I've been very open with a lot of my sponsors and so on. It's like, I haven't done it. Let's give it a shot. There have been a few of them that didn't work well. So I've, I've in some cases, I've discounted or donated it uh, just to be able to stay in good favor with them. But that's me. Um, I, I think there are a lot of things that we can be doing, like being ADA friendly. A lot of your older arenas are not. Now, that's part of the beauty when you're not somebody that's afflicted with an ADA issue. You know, those those steep ramps and so on, and the tight corners, those are a lot of fun to play in when you're somebody like you and me. But if you're trying to maneuver a wheelchair or have other issues, it just it, it keeps a large percentage of your population out. We also kept all of our lighting so we didn't do a lot of flashing. We could if, if the clients wanted it, but we could also go to just a static color. So if we had people that were epileptic or whatever, or were adverse to some type of light issues, we could change that just by pushing a button. And these are easy things that I think, whether you're mobile or an arena, the easy things that can be done that for whatever reason just aren't being done. I'll get off that soapbox. Well, I think those are very interesting considerations and probably very useful to know, especially as you're cultivating business. Uh, what do you do to reach out to to different places that might come up with a new idea? I mean, how do you get how do you get in with a Girl Scout group or with uh, you know one of these unique situations like with horseback riding? How do you cultivate that? Most of those came from our arena. Somebody that had been in the arena and played and said, too bad you can't do, insert whatever. And then I look at him and it's like, why can't we? And it's like, what do you mean? You can do that? So, well, we're mobile too, so let's give it a try. Uh, my employees typically have found me. I haven't had to go looking for them. They have found me. A lot of our best clients found us, not the other way around. Uh, so I, I'm in a unique situation in that, that aspect. I haven't had to spend the budget that a lot of people do for marketing and so on because our game style and our reputation leads to people calling from all over the country. Uh, I've had people from up in your neck of the woods, up in New York, call and say, hey, we've been told to call you. It's like, and how did you find out about us? And I said, did you talk to Tivia? They said, who? I'm sorry. <laughs> so not to be little you, but bring my ego right down there. <laughs> I naturally assume, hey, they've been talking to Lori. You know, that's how they got my name. And they, it wasn't. They found me through somebody else because of some of the unique things that we have done. Um, and I consider that to be a, a testament to what we do. Uh, we, we strive to always put our best foot forward every time we go out. Um, I want to be like it's my kid's event or whatever. If we're having an off day, that stops when we set foot on property. If you can't do that, you're not going to work for me, period. You have to be at 110% when we're on the field at all times, smiling, laughing, talking. Uh, my, my crew have their special events that they enjoy the most. You know, so when we get a call to go back to, say, University of Arkansas down in Pine Bluff, I have three guys arguing over who's going to go with me on that one because it's such a unique playing uh, situation. The students there are awesome. You know, they they show up hours before asking, how can they help us set up? How can they stick around? How can we help tear down? Uh, and I've spent time talking with them about how to build, you know, write up business plans. Uh, so, you know, don't be afraid to talk to them, get to know them. But that's how I get those referrals from other customers. Um, there are a few organizations that I have joined. Some of them have been good. Most of them have not. Uh, the, the one that I'm very involved in right now for the universities has been very good. And I've been doing trade shows, going in and talking to the students and so on that are making all the decisions. Uh, one of the things about colleges, though, these people move frequently. 
So when they move from one college to another, they know us. Now all of a sudden we're in that college too. We're still in the old one that they had been in, but now we're into the new one they've moved into as well. So it grows out that way too. Uh, so you have to make sure that reputation is always your best foot forward because they'll remember the bad ones more than they're going to remember the good ones. And the bad ones will get more talk than the good ones. Well, absolutely. And it's all about networking. It is. It really is. Uh, and that's something I've always enjoyed. So for me, it comes easy. As you know, I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's terrific. And um, I wonder with all of these uh, places that bring you in for private events, do you have any um, steady situation where an individual who hears about you and isn't connected with a college can, are there any opportunities where they can walk into a situation and play your your equipment or do you have to kind of be on the invite list at this point at this point it has to be on the invite list and i do look for like this summer i'm trying to set up at least a couple of locations where we can use whether it be a, a community center or a, a a city park or something like that so anybody that wants to come play can do so in part because when we close, we try to give everybody at least six weeks notice, but we have people out there that still have some gift certificates and so on. I, want, I don't want to just leave them hanging. I want to be able to give them a chance to be able to come in and play. Uh, so I'm trying to be do right for them as well. But I do have people that would like to try it out. And that's the downside to not having my arena anymore. Uh, and that's the main reason why I, I would entertain the thought of having another one again. Uh, because I do miss that aspect. Well, it sounds like you've really found the right niche for your business being mostly out in the field. What would you say is the most fun part of when you set up an event? For us, it's when people come in and go, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This is awesome. It's like, well, what were you expecting if it wasn't awesome? You know, that in my mind, that's like, why would you expect anything less than that? But for whatever reason, They've had other events with laser tag that weren't at that level, and that's what they were expecting. And to me, that's unfortunate for whoever I'm replacing, but it's great for me. Um, I would love to see everybody hit that same standard where everybody presents awesome every chance they can. I mean, every time they go out, I mean, we all have off nights. Just don't let the customer know it. Uh, so... If something's not going the way that you want it to, hide it from the customer. Let them know that it's the best thing that they've had. And they keep smiling. I mean, it's, I've had some terrible nights the customer never knew it. And that's what the way it should be. I guess I got that from DJ Weddings. It's like, this is your night. Hopefully you don't do it again. So I need to make sure that, uh, no, I didn't have one bride that was on her fourth wedding with me, but it's like, really, you don't have to get married to have a party. But, you know, it, my, my expectations were different than what a lot of other people are. And it absolutely has to be the best it can be. So when people come in and they look, and it's like, this is like walking into an arena somewhere. You know, we have moving heads. We have a real sound system, not just a full powered speaker, but a real PA. Uh, it's somewhere between going to a nightclub in a laser tag arena. And we let them run. We let them put the obstacles around. We let them have a good time. There are some nights that, uh, even with the college kids, corporate, they spend more time moving the obstacles around and building floors like a kid does with the sofa cushions. I don't care if they're having fun. Let them go to it as long as they're not hurting my stuff. Our, our three rules for laser tag. Don't break my stuff. Don't hurt each other. The really hard one, have a good time. Those are our three rules. If you're not breaking my stuff or hurting anybody else, I don't care. Have at it. So, just seeing that, that people's expression on their face when you walk in and see what they're doing that evening. To me, that makes it all worthwhile. Driving three days one way, yeah, that's that's a long three days living in a truck with me. You know, the guy that goes with me, uh, you know, Putting up maybe in a, a truck in a hotel for a week or two at a time is not easy. So, you know, it's got to be something special when we get there. Well, I think that's a good takeaway in your, your three rules, <laughs> good rules for life. So, so 
good note to uh, kind of wrap the main part of this up on, but I always like to end with a little rapid fire tag talk. So I throw some quick questions at you for quick answers sure. back. You game? Sure. All right. You kind of hit on this, but I'll just throw it out again. What's the most unusual event you've ever done with laser tag? It's, it's probably on horseback. I, second I, would be that bride. You know, the wedding would be second. But the uh, horseback, that's the one that gets most people. Yeah, I would think so. Okay, what's the coolest place you've ever visited for laser tag? Oh, wow. That's really hard because we've had a lot of cool events. Um, when we were at University of Arkansas Little Rock, we used a practice facility for basketball, and we had one team breach inside that had to maintain, maintain the facility while up three other teams breached the doors to take over. So that was cool. Um, Myrtle Beach was a lot of fun. We were playing out in the quads. I mean, it, it's really – it. I love them all. I, I don't really have any place I dread going back to. Uh, so – the rock quarry was a lot of fun. You just have to go when the copperheads are in hibernation. So, you know, that uh, that means winter time. <laughs> so much for the short answer. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Coolest prize you've ever won yourself or given away through laser tag? You probably own that. I think that I do probably own the coolest one. We've given away scopes uh, and so on, uh, different optics for people. Um a lot of free games and so on, but you have the only trophy that we've made using one of our rifle shells. That was very so cool. That was it's the most unique. Awesome. Well, I'm honored to have it in my collection. That was fun being part of your <laughs> Valentine's Day tournament. <laughs> Favorite energy drink to keep you on the move? Oh, wow. After having uh, two coolers full of everything that we ever wanted and then some, um, Currently, I'm stuck on the monster rehabs. Okay. Trying to lose weight. They taste good. I like it. Very good. Favorite brand of we never run in the arena or we never run even if we don't have an arena shoes. Oh, well, we've had a lot of people actually play barefoot, but <laughs> um, you said shoes, issues or shoes? Yes. Favorite brand of running shoes. Or we're not going to run shoes. It, a lot of the post proms and the high heels were very difficult. So they were just kind of stumbling to walk. It looked like some giraffes trying to play laser tag. So that's probably the most <laughs> fun to watch. You know, the guys in their tuxes and the ladies dressed up. It looks like James Bond out there with that laser tag. But, you know, 16 year old girl, high heels, spikes, stilettos. It, it, it's just not their thing yet. So that's probably the most fun to watch. Personally, I like a good old pair of tennis shoes. Okay. And what is the best reason to play mobile laser tag? It's fun. It's great exercise, but ultimately it's fun. If it's not fun, you're playing with the wrong people. Absolutely. Well, Kip, you have always made laser tag fun. I have enjoyed your arena. I hope someday maybe I'll experience your mobile setup as well. But I want to thank you so much for taking some time to talk with me and especially to compare and contrast the uh, the difference in those experiences. Uh, any final thoughts before we say goodbye? You know, just don't be afraid to try something different. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Move on. Don't dwell on it. Life's too short. Have fun. Play laser tag. Absolutely. That's a great takeaway. So I want to thank you. That's my guest, Kip Walker of Laser Trooper Laser Tag. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kip. Thanks for having me. Thanks for checking out this episode of Laser Unfocused Tag Talk. Listen for more episodes on the first and third Friday of each month. Want to be a guest on an upcoming episode? Find out more and follow my blog and website at tiviachickloveslasertag.com. 